Well, thanks, Bob, for that nice introduction. And um, I'd like to thank the department and the institute for inviting me here today to share my work, uh, our work, on uh, liver tissue engineering and also using micro nanotechnology tools along those lines. So um, I'd like to just start with this slide. Um, this is a slide from Netter's Anatomy. It's a complicated side of the liver meant to emphasize the complexity of liver functions in vivo. There's some 500 odd liver functions that are divided into four main categories, uh, detoxification, uh, production of plasma proteins, fat, carbohydrate, and protein metabolism, and also production of bile for digestion. So collectively, these are the functions of the liver. It's not surprising then that uh, when the liver fails, it's fatal. And that's a, an increasing problem due to hepatitis B and C worldwide. It's estimated that about 10% of the worldwide population carries one of these two viruses. So the gold standard um, of therapy for liver disease is whole organ transplantation. And as is the case for other tissues, there are really not enough uh, livers available for, um, to, for the demand that's required. So that has led to, over the years, uh, a lot of work in liver support technologies. Um, because of the complexity of the liver, most of these, these, these technologies are cell-based. So I'm going to emphasize two today. So the first uh, two, just for completeness, are hepatocyte transplantation. So this is typically intravenous or intraportal injection of hepatocytes. That, uh, this is done for sort of single gene defects in metabolic diseases. People are making uh, transgenic xenografts, typically humanizing the endothelium of whole organs. Um, and then the two that I'll focus on are, are shown down here. So the first, are, these are extracorporeal devices. They're, you can think of them as dialysis-like machines. They're typically hollow fiber cartridges, and they house hepatocyte-like cells. Over the last few years, there have been a couple of very disappointing, very expensive, very prominent failures in this area. Um, Primarily, we think because the hepatocytes or the hepatocyte-like cells in these devices um, are not functioning well. And as I'll show you, that's one of the main emphases then of my group, is how to get hepatocytes or hepatocyte-like cells to function in this sort of synthetic environment. Uh, the other thing that we and others are working on, which is a very lofty long-term goal, is actually making an implantable piece of liver tissue or tissue engineering of the liver. Um, and, and I'll touch on that a bit. So this is an overview of our, what my group is working on. So as I said, we're working on making functional engineered liver tissue. And there are a number of applications that we're interested in. So uh, therapeutic applications that I just mentioned. Um, the other sort of interesting thing that comes out of having this stable liver tissue in the lab is that it turns out to be a great model system to study multicellular epithelia. Uh, there's a lot of interesting biology here um, that one can study now in vitro. Um, instead of in vivo. And then the last application that we're interested in um, that comes out of having stable liver function in the laboratory is using, uh, miniaturizing these pieces of liver tissue and thinking about how to interface this with micro uh, technology and make in vitro platforms for drug screening for pharmaceutical applications. So these are the applications that we're interested in. Our approach is twofold. So there's a number of uh, somewhat unique problems to liver tissue, although I was talking to Dr. Sambanis last night and I, some of them are quite common actually in the pancreas world as well. Uh, so, so the first is that hepatocytes, uh, the mature hepatocyte is the functional cell of the liver, don't proliferate to any measurable degree in vitro. This is a huge problem. It's estimated that you need about 10% of the liver mass for a therapeutic benefit. So we and others are looking at stem cell sources then, which are a proliferative source then that could mature into a, a differentiated hepatocyte. The two stem cell sources that we're looking at are the uh, liver-specific stem cell called the oval cell. This is a bipotential cell that can make both the hepatocyte and the cholangiocyte, which is a biliary ductal cell. The other stem cell source is an embryonic stem cell source. We're looking at mouse embryonic stem cells. So I'm actually not going to talk at all about our stem cell work today, but I just wanted to, to let you know that, that we're working on that. What I will be talking about is the second problem, um, which is relatively unique to hepatocytes, and that is that they rapidly lose their phenotype in vitro. So you take them out of the animal, you put them in this device or in a construct or whatever it is, and they lose most of their liver-specific functions on the order of hours. 
So what we've been interested in is looking at the microenvironment of the hepatocytes in vivo and seeing whether we could learn what the hepatocytes see in vivo, what's important then for stabilizing their function in vitro. So this slide um, explains more what I mean. So this is the um, architecture of the liver in vivo. So for the chemical engineers in the audience, it's essentially a radial flow bioreactor. Uh, blood comes here, here in the periphery, drains to this central vein here um, in this radial flow pattern. And along the way, it encounters, encounters these hepatocyte cords. So it's a very efficient mass transport machine. And these hepatocytes then have very well-defined interactions with their microenvironment. They have very well-defined cell matrix interactions, pretty well-defined interactions with the blood that's streaming through and the soluble factors that are coming out of the gut. Um, and then interactions both with one another, we call those homotypic, and interactions with five other cell types in the liver, we call those heterotypic. So if you look at the liver biology literature, to some extent, many of these have been mimicked in vitro, and to some extent, all of these stabilize liver functions. So what I'll be focusing on is two particular ones, heterotypic co-culture and the role of oxygen in, in, the, uh, in the blood. So I'm going to start with the role of this heterotypic cell-cell interactions by describing an effect known as the co-culture effect in the literature. So this was an uh, effect in the hepatocyte world first reported in the early 1980s by a French group, the guggen Gioso group, and um, I'll describe it here to you in data. So the effect, as I mentioned before, um, hepatocytes when isolated, so these are isolated from the rat liver, are plated in vitro, they rapidly lose their phenotype. Here we're using albumin as a marker of one axis of liver-specific function, that's the liver's synthetic function, but this is true for all the other functions of the liver as well. So you plate these hepatocytes on collagen in a petri dish, and they lose this liver-specific function right away. If you look at them after 10 days, you'll have to trust me if you're not look, used to looking at hepatocytes, but these look horrible. These are very fibroblastic. They have indistinct nuclei, no bright intercellular boundaries. If on the first day of culture you add another cell type, so it turns out this works for, with many different cell types. Here we're showing 3T3 fibroblasts from a mouse source. If you add these on day one of culture, you see a dramatic upregulation and stabilization of this function for many weeks. Okay, so this has been known since the early 80s and the morphology of the, these are a hepatocyte cluster over here with nice bright nuclei, nice bright boundaries. They also have all the other functions that, that one can think about measuring. So it's not clear how this works, but if you think about uh, how one might use this as uh, bioengineers, you start to ask yourself some sort of very simple questions. So if I was going to put these in a hollow fiber bioreactor, what would be the ratio of the cells that I would use? Do they need to touch or could they be separated by a membrane? Is it important to have a hepatocyte neighbor, some level of homotypic contact, or is it okay to be alone? So those are the sorts of questions that we were thinking about asking when we st first started working on this problem. And you can see in a conventional culture, we call this a random co-culture. Hepatocytes here are fluorescently labeled red, and they're surrounded by these fluorescently labeled green fib uh, fibroblasts. What you can see is all of the variables are coupled. Okay, so for instance, if you want to change homotypic interaction, you lower the cell seeding density, you've changed the ratio, and so on and so forth. So what we did was we developed a microfabrication-based tool, the micropatterning tool, to uncouple some of these variables. So I won't go through the details of the process, but essentially what you do is you use semiconductor technology to do photolithography or photopatterning of collagen on, in this case, a glass wafer. Okay, so these are the exact same techniques that one would use for making microelectronic circuits on silicon. So you pattern collagen, on, in this case, on a glass wafer. You seed hepatocytes on that and they selectively adhere to that collagen. And then you surround the cells by seeding the, the fibroblasts in the presence of serum proteins. Those serum proteins will adsorb on this bare glass and then mediate the attachment of those fibroblasts in the periphery. Okay? So using this micropatterning tool, you can go from the random co-culture that I showed you before to highly organized tissues in vitro. Okay? So again, here these are the rat hepatocytes separated by uh, fibroblasts. So we set out then to ask some of these questions um, that I alluded to. So the first was, what is the role of heterotypic interaction? So we set up, these are four different culture conditions. And in each dish, we have the same number of constituent cells, same ratio of cells. But what's varying is the level of interaction between the cell populations. So here, these are single cell hepatocyte islands of 40 micron dimension. These are 100 micron colonies, 500 microns, and this one is many millimeters. Okay. 
So what you see is that in the absence of the surrounding stroma, in the absence of the surrounding fibroblasts, if you look at a couple of markers, again, this is after um, 10 days, what you see is both for nitrogen metabolism and for albumin production, in the absence of the fibroblasts, you see very low function. And that goes with the data I showed you before. In the presence of the fibroblasts, if you look down here, what you see is, uh, in a manner, a dose-dependent increase in tissue function such that the it, the cultures with the most interaction, with the smallest island, are more highly functional uh, than, for example, these. So these cultures are also very stable, but they're stable at a lower level. So we were curious at, to, about what was going on here, so we thought, let's stain the cultures and see which cells in this system are contributing to these secreted levels of protein. So we did just that. That's shown here. So this is immunohistochemical stain for albumin. So brown is albumin using horseradish peroxidase. And what you see on the left is hepatocytes alone, and on the right, hepatocytes in co-culture. So you'll see on day one, this is a 500 micron colony of hepatocytes. They're chock full of albumin. They've just come out of the liver. If you culture them in the absence of any neighbors, you see that that staining declines, as in the secreted data case. If you surround them with uh, fibroblasts, which you can't see here, um, because they're not staining for albumin, what you do see eventually is that the cells in the center, this is after six days of culture, the cells in the center behave as if they're seeing no fibroblasts at all, and the cells in the periphery actually are maintaining their albumin production. Okay? So this, it follows then that the cultures that had very large colonies or relatively little interface were stably functioning but at a lower level. Okay? Um, it's a bit more complicated than that, and I'm not going to go into the details here, but this, uh, this uh, ring, this differentiated ring of function, if you will, is actually about two to three cells deep, and not just one cell layer deep. Um, and what we think is happening here is um, there's a role for homotypic, gap junction-mediated signal propagation. Um, so again, I'm going to skip the details of that, but I'm happy to discuss it later. This is sort of our working model. Um, so what we think is happening is that there's these fibroblasts out here. They're signaling this hepatocyte colony through some heterotypic mechanism. And then these hepatocytes signal one another in this gap junction dependent way. Our thinking is that this homotypic signal at some point falls below a threshold, and therefore these central hepatocytes um, lose their phenotype. Uh, so this is a working model that we're actively testing with gap junction inhibitors and whatnot. But again, if you think about this as engineers, you start to ask yourself, what is this signal? Do you need these surrounding cells, and could you get away without them? Okay? So we were interested then in what, the what these specific mechanisms might be. And our approach then was to take a gene expression profiling approach. So what we did was we co-cultured hepatocytes with multiple different fibroblast cell types. So that data is here. So we looked at two functions, again, synthetic function and nitrogen metabolism. And up here, what you'll see is we've used four different fibroblast strains that are all mouse-derived and highly related. And we've co-cultured them with hepatocytes and scored them for their ability to induce differentiated function. So this clone was scored as high, these two as medium, and these as low. Okay? You can then gene expression profile, so look at all the genes that these cell types are making, and ask which genes share this pattern of high, medium, and low expression, and then also the reverse in case they're making an inhibitor. Okay? So we did that using Affymetrix gene chips, and again, I'm not going to go through the details, but we found that there are 190 genes differentially expressed in these systems. 24 of them have this high, medium, and low profile. You can see high, medium, and low. Okay, and I'm not going to bore you with the gene list, but um, I have to show just one. So this is, the, um, these, this is the gene list for the genes that are positively correlated. So they are high, medium, and low in the same way that the function is. And what we did was we sorted them by um, basically their role in the fibroblasts. And what you see is some are on the cell surface, some are secreted, and some are in the extracellular matrix. So again, as engineers, we're very interested in the ones that are expressed on the cell surface that are secreted or that are matrix because we think those are candidates for replacing the fibroblasts completely. So what I'd like to focus on is this particular molecule, Decrin. This is a, a part of glycan that's in the extracellular matrix. It's bound to collagen. And um, what we wanted to do is then go back and test in our system whether Decrin had any ability to support the differentiated function of hepatocytes. 
So we did two experiments. The first experiment is shown here on the left. Again, uh, synthetic function and nitrogen metabolism. And what we did was plate hepatocytes um, on an adsorbed layer of collagen or on an adsorbed layer of collagen that was co-incubated with Decrin. Okay? And what you see is a statistically significant increase in function in both cases. Unfortunately, though, if you look at the axis over here, the function of these cells is actually still quite low. So over time, they go on to lose their phenotype and die. Okay? So we haven't rescued them completely with this molecule. The next experiment that we did was to add Decrin to the low-performing co-cultures and ask whether we could boost their function to a higher level. So you'll remember that we had co-cultures with a low-inducing fibroblast strain. We asked, how do they do in the presence of Decrin? So here we've done a dose-dependent experiment. These are, um, these are hepatocytes alone. These are the low-performing co-cultures. And these are the low-performing co-cultures in the presence of increasing amounts of Decrin. Okay, so we see a dose-dependent increase in the function of these co-cultures. We get up to about 40% of the maximal level by this, dose depend by this exposure to Decrin. Okay? So again, we don't have the whole co-culture effect. We've got part of the co-culture effect by adding this one molecule. So what we're doing now is going back to our gene list and looking at some of the other candidates of interest. Um, but we're encouraged by this data in, in, in the sense that these are some of the first molecules that are, uh, are new in this field in quite some time in terms of uh, what might be going on. Okay, so this is just to summarize. So the co-culture stabilizes the hepatocyte phenotype. We think that there's a non-diffusible signal that comes from the fibroblasts, that signals might be propagated via gap junctions, and the sort of, regardless of the mechanism, the moral of the story is we have very high levels of function in our optimized co-cultures relative to other culture models in the, in the literature, and also relative to in vivo levels. Some of the remaining questions that we're working on are, um, for example, is continuous signaling required? Does the second cell type need to keep signaling the hepatocytes, or is it enough to sort of kick them into a differentiated state? Will they stay there? So we've set up a collaboration with Milan Merksic at the University of Chicago, and he works on uh, dynamic surfaces. And uh, he's got a chemistry with an electroactive uh, tether on an RGD. Okay? So we see the fibroblasts on RGD that has this electroactive linker. You apply a small potential, then you can release these fibroblasts after having performed the co-culture for a certain amount of time. So this is a model system that we've set up. We've now just got our first release, and we're getting uh, ready to find out what the biology is. The second question, as I mentioned, is can we replace the fibroblasts? So we're looking at some of the other candidates on that list. And the last question is a bit of a teleological question, but it helps frame our thinking. And that is, what actually are we seeing here? What is this interaction that is so robust between hepatocytes and many different mesenchymal cells? Is it a physiological interaction that exists in the normal liver in vivo? Is it something that mimics embryology? Because in fact, the endoderm, the developing endoderm of the liver interacts with surrounding mesoderm. Uh, or is it something that happens in repair, for example, in regeneration, when again, these sorts of interactions are known to occur? And the reason we're interested in that is we think that some of the other gene candidates, uh, for example, the soluble candidates, might actually um, have clinical utility as what are known uh, in the liver world as hepatoprotectants uh, to boost regeneration, for example. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about cell-cell interaction. I mean, I'd like now to move on to another microenvironmental cue that's very well defined in vivo that we think might be useful in vitro, and that is the role of oxygen. So until now, I've been talking about hepatocytes like all hepatocytes are created equal, but in fact they're not. So if you look at um, the capillary of the liver, the liver sinusoid, and you linearize it, what you'll see is distinct populations of gene expression along this length. Okay? That's referred to in the literature as liver zonation. And so these cells are referred to as periportal or near the, peri near the portal vein. These are perivenous or near their central vein. And what you'll see is that carbohydrate metabolism and detoxification and a number of other liver functions are actually compartmentalized in these different cell populations. It's not clear 
Um, what causes this zonation? This is a sort of a, a recurring question in the literature. What's the cause and effect? What we know is that these are exposed to high levels of oxygen that is progressively depleted and high levels of hormones that are progressively depleted. These are, these are more innervated. These are more exposed to the accumulated cell products of the sinusoid. So they're essentially a series of steady state gradients that exist in this environment. We are we're particularly interested in oxygen uh, for a number of reasons, one of them being that as engineers we know we can control it very well in a reactor setting. So um, this is some clinical significance um, and also significant for drug development in the following way. This is a histological section of the liver. This is a central vein here. This is a normal liver. What you've, you'll see um, in the presence of Tylenol or acetaminophen, which some of you may know is a, a wonderful hepatotoxin, um, is pericentral cell death. Okay? And essentially what happens is that the, the P450 enzymes, which are localized here in the pericentral region, generate a toxic metabolite locally and that causes local cell death. Okay, so liver zonation also has uh, zona, zonal hepatotoxicity consequences. So we were interested in whether we could add some of these features, these zonal features of the liver back to our in vitro models because they do seem to be so important. So what we did was set up a parallel plate bioreactor that works in the following way. Hepatocytes are a monolayer on the bottom and we set up the flow conditions such that basically oxygen is progressively depleted as the solution traverses. So we have a simple model of that, which I won't go through, but essentially you can control the dimensions of this re reactor, the convection, the diffusion, and then the reaction at the surface. Um, so this is what the schematic of what it looks like in the lab. I'll show you a picture in a minute. <laughs> it doesn't look quite so pretty. Uh, so this is the bioreactor. We have an oxygen probe at the outlet. This is a computer-controlled syringe pump and a gas exchanger on it. So this is a picture of the system in the lab. This is a little incubator and the reactor is sitting in here. Here's the syringe pump. This is a 2D report of the model. And essentially what we first went out set out to do was test our model predictions. So we varied oxygen in this reactor in two ways. So the first was you could control the inlet oxygen concentration and then you can change the flow rate. As the flow rate gets slower, then the outlet oxygen concentration is lower and lower, as you would expect. You can model the oxygen uptake at the surface of the cells either as a maximal uptake or in a Michaelis-Menten form, and we've done both. The other way to vary the oxygen tension is just lower the inlet oxygen uh, concentration with which you equilibrate, and again, you can see the model matches the predictions quite well. Okay, so we were pretty comfortable that uh, we, were, we knew the oxygen um, concentrations in this reactor. We set out to do the experiment that I described. So we isolate a mixed population of hepatocytes, we plate them this in this reactor, we expose them to this oxygen gradient for 24 hours, and then we harvest the cells from different zones and in western blots for particular proteins. So this is a P450 enzyme that's supposed to be up in the pericentral region. This is involved with carbohydrate metabolism, Pepsi-K. It's supposed to be up two to five fold in vivo in the periportal region. Okay, so we've started with a mixed population of cells and then added back some zonal protein um, expression. So then the next experiment was then can we capture the zonal hepatotoxicity feature that would occur because of this. So what we did essentially was dose our bioreactor with acetaminophen, okay, so, and then stained with MTT. So this is a viability stain, purple is live. This is a, a looking down on this slide from the inlet to the outlet. So this is a relatively low concentration of Tylenol, and you should be able to see that most of the cells are alive. This is a relatively high concentration of Tylenol. You should see that all the cells are dead. And at this intermediate concentration, what you should be able to see is that the inlet, inlet cells are living and the outlet cells are dying. Okay, so again, pericentral death that we think is mediated by oxygen-mediated local, uh, local concentrations of P450 enzymes. Okay, and that's quantitation of the data. Okay, so what I've showed you so far is the role of the microenvironment in stabilizing uh, engineered tissue in the lab and then adding some of the in vivo features that are really missing to date. Um, and uh, I, I think I've highlighted ways in which we think this is a good model system for exploring some of the structure function relationships. So what I'd like to now touch on is some of our early ideas about how one might go about building three-dimensional tissues that one could implant 
Um, again, this is a very lofty goal, but we're, we're sort of making baby steps in this direction. So liver architecture is highly three-dimensional. If you look through the literature and see what people have done in the hepatic tissue engineering space, these are some examples. Hepatocytes uh, seated on microcarriers, pre-aggregated in spheroids, or seated on biodegradable scaffolds. And by and large, what you see um, is that hepatocytes being so highly metabolic cannot essentially be passively nourished in this environment. So you really need convection to carry oxygen and nutrients to this large mass of cells. So the two approaches that have been taken is, are um, to actually try and encourage angiogenesis in this system or to create some sort of perfusion system where you can add convection through the scaffold. So in the perfusion world, one approach that's been taken is to build three-dimensional scaffolds that then you would seed with cells. So these are a series of uh, three-dimensional scaffold fabrication technologies pulled from the literature. And essentially what you see in all the cases, these are layer by layer, what we call additive freeform fabrication technologies. So um, they're all layer by layer technologies for building three-dimensional architectures on which one would seed cells and then one would have channels through which to provide convection. Now, there's a few challenges with using this approach for liver tissue engineering. So the first I've already mentioned, but I'll highlight again, and that is that hepatocytes don't grow. So this is different than other tissue engineering in the sense that you can't just seed the scaffold and then grow up a whole bunch. Okay, basically you, get, you end with what you start with. The second problem is that hepatocytes are notoriously non-migratory. So essentially they stay where they land. They don't then go on to populate the graft very effectively. So our idea was to try and combine this approach of something that had convective channels with a scaffold that had cells embedded within it. So what we wanted to do was then adapt as a proof of principle a well-known chemistry that was first uh, developed by Jeff Hubble's group. So these are photopolymerizing hydrogels in which these are uh, PEG diacrylate based, so polyethylene glycol hydrogels in which you can mix cells, photo initiator, shine light, and the hydrogel then uh, cross-links in the presence of cells and entraps the cells. So we wanted to use that chemistry combined with this idea, which is a stereolithography idea. So stereolithography is a rapid prototyping, layer by layer uh, fabrication technology, where essentially you shine light in a different pattern for every layer of the part, and you build a three-dimensional part. So we wanted to do this uh, layer by layer building of a live tissue. So this is uh, our idea of what one might make. So this would be a first layer of a tissue that has these sort of hexagonal uh, structure with cells embedded within it. This would be another layer. Let's say this would be a third. And then if you look at it in this direction, this is sort of like a network with, of branching channels. So we built um, a benchtop device to do this. Essentially then what you do is inject in this device a pre-polymer solution with cells. You put a mask on top of it, shine light through the mask, and then wash away the uncross-linked areas, and then you can repeat this in a layer-by-layer -layer fashion. So we first did this with uh, single-layer structures that's shown here on the left. So these are hydrogels that contain living cells on a, a glass surface. This is, again, a single-layer structure that has two different domains. So um, this has, for, for people who aren't used to working with hydrogels, sort of the feel of, a, let's say, a soft contact lens, but it has different domains of cells within it. So, to our knowledge, it's, it's very difficult to make this structure in, in, in other ways. So all the cells have a three-dimensional microenvironment, but you can control the architecture of the tissue. These are um, like cells that have actually been arrayed for high-throughput screening applications. So the spatial resolution of this technique, we really haven't pushed the limits. We're using, from the microfabrication world, what, would what one would consider really low uh, really poor technology, we use transparencies as masks. So the resolution of these things is about 7 to 10 microns. So we get about 100 micron resolution um, using the, the techniques that we're using, but we, we now think we can go uh, easily down to the single cell level, which is about 20 microns. We first started with very robust cell types. So these are all done with a hepatoma cell type, hep G2, and fibroblasts. And we'd like to then move on to doing primary hepatocytes. So uh, these are some data with primary hepatocyte structures. So again, to remind you what we're trying to do, 
These are viable fluorescently labeled hepatocytes. So I show this slide. My grad student would kill me because it took her a long time to get here. We had to change photo initiators and, and you know, the whole thing. It, the system is very different than the previous slide. But for the purposes of this talk, I'll skip all that and say we now have viable hepatocytes <laughs> in these constructs here. They've been fluorescently labeled in these three structures. Here we've made a multi-layer structure, which is actually quite difficult to visualize. You can try and get a sense for it in this confocal image. Here we've rendered the first two layers in MATLAB for you to see a little bit better. Okay, so we're starting to build these three-dimensional structures. These are three-dimensional microstructures, so these struts here are 150 microns. This is a three-layer structure from the top down. And here we've labeled the first population red, the next one green, and the next one blue. Okay, so um, the reason I do that in this in this um, slide is also to highlight the fact that we think this could be a tool that would be useful for tissue engineering other tissue types. Um, the fact that we've labeled the cell types different colors in different layers is meant to indicate that you could have different cell types in different layers. You could have different hydrogel chemistries in different layers. You could have different microcarriers embedded within those hydrogels secreting growth factors of different kinds. So we think it's a very versatile tool for sort of starting to build three-dimensional tissues. So what's next for us from a liver perspective? Patocytes are adhesion dependent, and these are completely inert hydrogels. So we have a collaboration with Jennifer West at Rice um, to look at um, peptide derivatizing these hydrogels. So we're looking at the integrin profiles of these hepatocytes and what peptides then to put in. We'd like them to be degradable uh, with MMP degradable sites, uh, matrix metalloproteinase degradable sites. We are actively conditioning them in bioreactor units and developing an animal model of liver failure at UCLA. Um, and then we'd like to study in the lab some of the three-dimensional structure function relationships that we've shown in 2D. So again, this is a very long way to go before we have an implantable piece of liver, but this is our sort of stepwise approach. Okay, so what I've told you so far is that we've, we're trying to uh, engineer these functional pieces of liver tissue, that they're good model systems for some basic science, that we're making some progress towards therapeutic applications, and then what I'd li like to talk about is how one might use these as in vitro screening tools. So let me just sort of step back for a second. This um, idea of doing biology in a chip-based platform is part of a larger arena, um, that is what I'll call chip-based biosystems. So in this space, there um, people do molecular biology on a chip, essentially. You could have chips of DNA, RNA, protein, or drugs. People do integrated laboratory functions on a chip, so let's say a whole sequencing reaction, so uh, from a sample all the way to sequence. We call those lab-on-a-chip devices. And then what I'll be talking about and what, uh, for example, Linda Griffith's work uh, is on are in integrating live cells with chip technologies. Okay, so this would also be, for example, Solomics um, and, and some other companies in this space. So why are people interested in doing things on a chip? There's lots of miniaturization arguments, um, and these essentially amount to uh, you get more for less. <laughs> <laughs> and so I won't go through them all. But uh, there's also some interesting microscale phenomena that motivate this work. So it's been clear for a long time that there's physics at the microscale that one can exploit. For example, surface forces dominate lots of things, and you can use those to your advantage. It turns out that we and others have shown more recently that there's also some interesting biology at the micro and nano scale that might be useful in these platforms. So that's been another driver to go towards this, these length scales. Okay, so these are what these chips look like. For sometimes, if there are electrical engineering engineers in the audience, they, they don't know what I mean. So these are these are plastic chips with reservoirs and microfluidic channels. That's the kind of chip that I'm talking about. Okay, so this is a vision for this type of work. So this is a schematic of an imaginary population of cells. Here, they're all fluorescing a different color. All different. Um, reporting on all different activities. They're in interfaced with some synthetic platform. It can be interrogated with microfluidics. You could maybe even have optical tweezers then in to manipulate particular cells of interest. So what would it take to make something like this happen? You need to first and foremost control the cell function in this kind of environment. So I think one thing that's perhaps been lost when this has been approached from a straight engineering perspective is that if you interface cells with a synthetic surface and they, are no, they no longer behave, 
as if they, like they did in the body, the data that you get out is actually not useful. Okay, so you need first and foremost to have your cell reporting on what it would be doing in vivo to make this a useful idea. And so in that regard, we think lots of the tissue engineering concepts um, can be actually applied to this area of research. Um, the, the next thing you need to do is integrate your cells through synthetic and living systems. You need to think about how one would interrogate them and detect signals, how to automate these things and screen in parallel. And then for some applications, you'd actually like to miniaturize these devices and make them portable. So people have thought about this for point of care diagnostics or for chem bio warfare detection, that kind of thing. Okay, so the applications, as I mentioned, are in drug screening, also functional genomics, and I'll show you a little of our work in stem cell biology. So what, what I won't be talking at all about is the automation and parallel screening. There are plenty of companies actually in this space uh, working on automated image processing, autofocus, how to handle large volumes of data, that kind of thing. And we're really not um, so much focused on, on that aspect of automation um, because, we, because we, we think that um, there, there's sort of a downstream technology ready for that. So what we're really interested in are the first three issues, controlling the cell function at the interface, integrating the live cells with the synthetic surfaces, and then how one might start to detect signals from these um, systems. So the first one I've really already talked about, so I won't talk about it again here. We think that um, we've, we've come a long way to, to stabilizing liver cells in the laboratory and that that would be useful in this platform. So what I will talk about is what are some of the handles one can use to manipulate cells in these settings. Um, chemistry is very useful, so selective adhesion as I've shown you. Topology, physical um, environments, fluidics. Treating the cells like objects that are charged and using electric fields to move them around. Or objects that um, scatter light, so you could also use optical forces. So I'll t um, we've done many of these, I'll touch on a few examples. So the first is a selective adhesion example, and this is a collaboration with one of these companies just to um, miniaturize our assay in a way that you could actually think about doing drug screening in any realistic way. So this is the miniaturization to a 24 well plate assay um, from the experiments I described to you before. So the micropatterning I described to you previously was done on a two inch wafer, so a P60. And it, it was, uh, you had to do the fabrication on every single wafer. You use it, and then you can't use it again. Okay, so that's how I did my PhD, but no one's going to go around <laughs> screening drugs that way. So, um, so this is a, an attempt to try and parallelize some of that. So what we've done here is switch microtechnology platforms from what I referred to before as hard lithography to this is called soft lithography. So this basically takes advantage of polydimethylsiloxane, so PDMS, which is an elastomer. And essentially you're looking down here on a 24 well plate system. On the bottom of each of these wells is an array of holes or stencils, okay? You can then put collagen or whatever your protein of interest is on top of this and it will adsorb to the exposed underlying surface and then peel away the stencil, okay, as shown here. So we've done that with them and are created micro-patterned arrays of hepatocytes and co-cultures and gone out, I should update this now, to eight weeks and shown stable function in this platform. So this is just a technological step to creating, uh, to miniaturizing and paralyzing this system. Okay, so the, the, um, that was an example of chemistry or selective adhesion. The next thing I'd like to show you is an example um, where actually that was not uh, desired. So we started a collaboration with Rusty Gage, who's a neural stem cell biologist. He was interested in the differences within a stem cell population. So he actually did not want any kind of micropatterning approach that pulls down selective cell populations because of, the, because of their integrin profile, let's say. He wanted something where we could look at all the cells growing and the differences between them. So what we did with him is set up the following system. So um, this is, it's actually a modified rose chamber for those of you who do microscopy. So this is essentially um, a chamber in which you can grow cells, you can stick it on the incubator, put it back on the uh, microscope stage and monitor them every day. And what we've done is add uh, a basically 10,000 wells in the bottom of this thing. Okay, so this is a chamber. These are a microfabricated array of wells in the bottom. And what we do is this is a syringe coming in with cells suspended in it is inject cells into the system, let them sediment by gravity, this takes about five minutes, wash away the cells that have not fallen into the wells, okay? 
Um, and now, this is on a cover slip, so you could do very high magnification if you want to. We put this on the microscope stage, which is run uh, on an XY automated platform. You can raster through all the domains, all 10,000 wells, every day and come back to the same fields and monitor exactly what's going on. So if you see this at a, these at a high density, these are fluorescently labeled cells looking down at them. But again, as I said, he was really interested in clonal cell growth. So this is just one view of, again, 10,000 wells. So these are cells that started out as single cells. These are these neural stem cells. And we've come back to the same field. This is day two, day four, day six. You can watch them growing. What we've done now is differentiate these cells at the end of the experiment and ask, how does the differentiation potential of these cells correlate with its proliferative history? Okay, so this is just an example of how one might use this sort of technology in stem cell biology. Okay, so the last example I'll give of this sort of technology um, is, is, again, treating cells as objects that are either charged and moving them around with electrophoresis or treating them as objects that are polarizable in a different way than their outside medium, okay? And that actually um, is called dielectrophoresis. So dielectrophoretic force moves objects around by the gradient of the E field squared. So basically, uh, objects are polarizable in a different way relative to the outside medium. And you can use that to move them around and array them and interface them with these sort of chip technologies. So this is um, a, a different setup than the one I described previously. So this is a microfabricated array of electrodes that are made uh, on a transparent semiconductor called indium tin oxide. And the reason we use a transparent semiconductor is so that we can watch things in real time on the microscope. Okay, so here these are the electrodes, and then they're surrounded by an insulator here, which is a, what we call a thick photoresist, and the counter electrode is up top. So basically, what, um, if you look at the E-field in this thing, you'll see that the E-field maxima are, are on the um, electrodes, and the E-field minima are sort of in this honeycomb pattern between them. If you put cells um, in this sort of configuration with the frequencies that we use, they undergo what we call positive dielectrophoresis. That is, they go to the E-field maxima, okay, shown here. So um, if you do that, these are uh, chondrocytes. Say so this is a time axis down here, arraying over about a minute, forming uh, clusters on the surface. This is a, an array of highly defined clusters. Um, this project actually we, um, is, is really actually a tissue engineering project. What we're doing here is arraying chondrocytes into different cluster sizes to look at the role of cell-cell interaction in chondrocytes. Um, in a relatively three-dimensional way. So we didn't want to array them on a surface and have them spread against the surface because that's not the chondrocyte microenvironment. So what we do is we cluster them in these clusters and then we embed them in the hydrogel that I showed you previously. Okay, so they have a relatively three-dimensional microenvironment of a very well-defined cluster size. Okay, um, if you put beads into a system like this, what you'll see is that they undergo, for example, a polystyrene bead of about the same dimensions, they undergo what's called negative dielectrophoresis. So they should go to the honeycomb pattern between the electrodes. So here what we've done is put in both. What you should see is sorting. So the cells are going to the E-field maxima, the beads are going to the E-field minima. Okay. This is a low mag version of that. And um, from a sensing perspective, this actually becomes quite useful because there are plenty of bead-based sensing technologies. So there are oxygen-sensitive bead coatings, pH-sensitive bead coatings, and so on and so forth. So we've started a collaboration with David Walt at Tufts University to look at, uh, essentially, whether exploring the idea of whether we could have a sort of family of sensors around a cluster of live cells that one could then interrogate remotely with fluorescence. So this is a sort of sensing application. Okay, so we've looked at a lot of other handles and I'm not going to go through uh, the details. Sort of, uh, sort of the, the moral of the story is, uh, depending on your application, various handles are um, useful for interfacing cells with these chip platforms. Um, these chemistry and topology are very biocompatible in the sense that you're really not perturbing the biology very much. These you start putting energy in the system and you have to work very hard then to look at um, viability and gene expression changes as a result of, of the perturbations. Okay, so in the last couple minutes, I'd just like to, uh, to touch on um, some, some work that we're doing in detection. So we were interested in applying quantum dots to imaging in live cells. 
So quantum dots, as many of you know, are, um, are nanoparticles that have size tunable fluorescence. Um, this is a slide taken from Xu Ming Ni's group. Um, so the quantum dots here, for example, there are cadmium selenide quantum dots that have a zinc sulfide cap. So these are particles that are nano. They're two to five in, uh, nanometers in diameter. They have size tunable fluorescence. So these are smaller particles. These are bigger particles. They're all being exposed with one handheld UV lamp, and they're emitting based on their size. Um, so people had previously used these for um, tracking cells, either via endosomal labeling, so the receptor-mediated endocytosis, they get sequestered in the endosome, and you could then track those cells um, as they, let's say, migrate around, or um, tracking them in the embryo, so sort of whole cell tracking. Um, people had been very excited about using them for biological applications because they're relatively bright and they're relatively photostable, that is, they don't uh, photobleach in the same way that organic dyes do. They also have some potential for being multicolor labels, so you could imagine labeling more than one thing, as one, more thi one thing at once. So we felt that their, their promise as subcellular labels had not really been fully realized. So I think anybody who works in sort of the cell and molecular space thinks, you know, the endosome is a nice place to be, but it's usually a place you want to get out of. <laughs> right? so, um, so we, we took the following approach. We um, modified the surface of these quantum dots with peptides, and our goal was to have the cells use these peptides to traffic the quantum dots to various locations of interest. And then also, uh, we co-modified the quantum dots with polyethylene glycol to prevent nonspecific binding. So the um, first experiment that I'll describe is a microinjection experiment where just the control Q dots are injected. So that's done up here. This is a phase micrograph of the cell, and you'll see that the cell has been microinjected with green Q dots, and they're excluded from the nucleus um, and, and quite well dispersed. So the next thing we did was then put a nuclear localization sequence taken from the SV40 um, virus on these quantum dots, and um, it uses the important machinery on the nuclear envelope and to see whether we could traffic these things now to the nucleus. So again, this cell has been microinjected, and now the quantum dots have trans located from the cytoplasm here to the nucleus, and they're excluded from the nucleoli, but they're in the nucleus, okay? Then the last thing we did was to put a mitochondrial localization sequence on these. Okay, so this is a mitochondrial localization sequence. These are the Q dots that are, have a punctate cytoplasmic uh, staining, and we co-localize them with a mitotracker dye that's commercially available, and this is the merge. Okay. We've then shown that you can um, watch these under continuous exposure for eight minutes uh, with relatively little photo bleaching, whereas the mitotracker bleaches out in about 15 seconds. So we think that this is at least a first step towards trying to realize some of the potential for these things as subcellular um, uh, dyes. Okay, and then this is my last slide, and I just threw it in because um, I wanted to show the data, and it really doesn't fit in my talk, so <laughs> I apologize, but uh, here it is. So we've used the same approach, um, and our idea was to actually use um, the same approach to target um, tissues in vivo. Okay, so this was a study that we published last year with Erki Ruslati at the Burnham Institute, and he has a set of homing peptides that he's derived using phage display technology that can home to the endothelium of tumors and various normal tissues. So what we did was label um, red Q dots with a tumor homing peptide, green Q dots with a normal lung endothelium homing peptide, co-inject them uh, in the animal, and then ask whether they would sort. So um, these are images where the red Q dots have sorted to the tumor and the green to the lung. So this is a part of a new three-year project um, that we, we've just had funded to, to build um, smarter nanoparticles that don't just glow. Um, so, okay. So hopefully what I've shown you is um, some of our work on engineering functional tissue, therapeutic, scientific, and technological applications of these things. Uh, in general, from a tissue engineering perspective, I think it's clear in our system and in many others that in vivo cues can enhance tissue function in vitro. I've shown you examples of cell-cell interaction and oxygen. I think it's also true that micro and nanotechnology tools that have been very well developed in other industries can be leveraged in cell and tissue biology and bioengineering. Here we've shown you examples about how one might use them to study fundamental tissue biology, how one might go about building three-dimensional tissues, 
how one might think about building cell-based biochips and how one might target tissues in vivo. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and thank my collaborators and my group and our generous funding sources. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Angita. Let's open the questions. <laughs> Let me ask one. Mm -hmm. Back at the very early part of your talk, when you talked about co culture, mm -hmm. um, a lot of it was monolayer, although some apparently were clumps of cells. Mm -hmm. But if, if you just look at the patocytes themselves, how different are they in functional characteristics in monolayer versus in a three dimensional structure? So that's a good question, and it's, I think, a recurring one lately because there are three dimensional model systems even in vitro. Um, so the functions that we measure, the cell autonomous functions, so for example, albumin, P450, metabolism, we see very high levels of those functions. It's very clear that what we will never see is some of the three-dimensional functions of hepatocytes in vivo, for example, the bile tree, the biliary tree, that emerges from a three-dimensional configuration. So that for sure is missing, and I suspect other things that arise from that, which is the polarity-dependent function. Thanks for a very interesting talk. I have a couple of quick questions. The first is regards the, the your studies with the oxygen tension. I wonder if you um, investigated the dynamics of hepatocyte response to oxygen and the, revers the reversibility of how long, for example, they had to be exposed to this oxygen tension to display the differential expression of the proteins that would assay by Western blood. So that's question number one. Okay. So question number one, so uh, we haven't extensively explored that, and the reason for that is there's an expert in this area, he's a German fellow by the name of Youngerman, who's spent quite a bit of time in static model systems over the years looking at the dynamics. So his data suggests about six hours um, is, is, is the, uh, the time frame required for um, protein expression changes. We were actually really interested in HIF, hypoxia inducible factor, as a potential mediator of this and uh, spent a few years with the transgenic system trying to look at that. Um, and it looks like it's not HIF mediated, but HIF might be doing other things. And that's actually a faster time course than the six hours. So there's a, some, another oxygen responsive element. And how about reversibility? Uh, we have not looked at reversibility. The second question has to do with your uh, uh, photopolymerizable hydrogels. I presume that the data that you showed us um, uh, with the cells uh, are under perfusion or early on after preparation. So I showed a bunch of data. So the viable cells, the viable hepatocytes were early on. Those were 24 hour. Okay. Um, the, I mentioned on the uh, one slide that we're perfusing these in bioreactors. Uh, so we're just now doing that. So the, the three dimensional constructs um, the, the multi-day experiments are ongoing. So I presume the pores are small enough to trap the hepatocytes within these gels. And then would you anticipate perhaps any problems in driving the perfusion flow through as a hepatocyte deposit extracellular matrix? So, uh, y yes. So we've started with a very simple model system. And actually, another problem <laughs> that you didn't mention is that we've got a very tight pore size. Um, so we're using a 3,000 molecular weight um, peg, and we need actually pretty large proteins to come out of the hepatocyte. So we actually want to loosen the polymer network without compromising mechanical integrity, which is why we're thinking about the MMP system so that we could be putting down matrix and degrading the polymer system um, in concert over time. So tuning the transport to the hepatocyte surface is sort of a paramount design feature of the next step. We're just getting started. Robert? Nice talk, Samita. Uh, I had a follow-up on the oxygen question. I wonder, so you haven't applied any of the gene editing. I think is it feasible to do that? I wonder if BCL2 has something to do with it also, and how does that in terms of Yeah, so I didn't show the data. We have done that, actually. So, um, but we've done it in the extreme. So we did hepatocytes under hypoxia versus normoxia 
presence of absence of HIF and in the presence of an absence of in P450 inducers. Um, because we're interested in the crosstalk between P450 and hypoxia that's in the literature. And then we gene expression profiled those and got some candidate genes. Um, I haven't looked at the PCL2 specifically. We see a lot of cell cycle stuff. So we're kind of interested in whether this might be a trigger for regeneration. Um, there's a, a lot of literature on apoptosis in the liver, of bile acids mediated apoptosis, and it's a very active field in liver biology. So, you know, sort of the side of my brain is interested in what might be going on there, but we haven't looked at apoptosis specifically. Mm -hmm. Usually, uh, you know, my experience, the nervous tissue is that soluble factors are much more potent differentiation factors than our PCM or, or bound homologous factors. And I wonder if you have any, I, I know you're looking at soluble factors, so you, have you looked at any to look as a potential candidate that's perhaps more impressive than uh, what Decker was doing? So, yeah, so the two things um, that come to mind with Decrin that we're looking at are TGF-beta, because TGF-beta binds Decrin, and there's a lot of clear interactions, and then um, Dr. Yu's group in Singapore has actually reported the role for TGF-beta in co-culture, so we think that hangs together with our story. The other thing is that Decrin binds to a non-EGF binding site on EGF receptor, and um, we've been thinking that there might be an interaction with EGF and Decrin in the same way that there's an FGF heparin sulfate proteoglycan interaction. Um, so those are experiments that we're setting up to do. Uh, do you face any uh, problems of cytotoxicity and uh, autofluorescence when you use SU8 uh, in, in one of your uh, systems where you have an SU8 pattern layer? Um, so yes, autofluorescence is a problem with most photoresist systems in the stem cell biology example. Autofluorescence is a big problem with our last staining step. So how do you get around these two? So we don't have a cytotoxicity problem. Um, we used to, and then we started leaching uh, the surfaces. We do an overnight leaching step. And Shuvo Roy has recently published a biomaterials paper looking at the various photoresists and what you need to do to make them biocompatible. So it looks like there's um, some solvent that is a leachable one that can make them make it more biocompatible. Other questions? One final question. Okay. Do you just throw decorant in, or does it have to be bound, assembled in a proper way in order to get an effect. Yeah, so we co-incubate it with collagen, knowing that it binds collagen one. We, we never even tried it alone, but I presume that it wouldn't work. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.